Hi everyone, and for those who don't know me, my name is Nadia and I'm on Summit's team. I just wanted to drop in before the session officially kicks off and say hi and welcome to Young World Leaders Summit. While in a normal year we'd be gathering on the slopes of Powder Mountain or the beaches of Tulum, Mexico, as you can see, we're doing things a little bit different this year. Thank you for joining Summit's first virtual event as it is so important for us that in spaces like this, where leaders, learners, makers with impact at the forefront of their work can convene and share resources. And to all the Summit Junto members in this meeting, thank you for your participation and support. Remember, as a Junto member, you can join us backstage after this session for an intimate Q&A conversation with the speaker. For those who want to learn more and apply to Summit Junto, our annual membership program where Summit curates your personal advisory board to help you navigate life's major challenges, head over to summit.co forward slash Junto forward slash impact to learn more. And now without further ado, I will pass it over to Michelle, our legendary Summit MP to kick off this session. Impact investing. It feels like a buzzword that we throw around all the time, but really it's the wave of the future for creating sustainable and generative solutions to our social and environmental challenges. Sir Ronald Cohen's new book, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change, is the foundation of this conversation. And if you purchase the book, all the proceeds will go to charity. So I'm, I'm so super excited to introduce this dynamic conversation between a few friends. Cheryl Dorsey, president of Echoing Green, Sir Ronald Cohen, and Summit Fellow Daquan Oliver. Cheryl met Daquan while he was an Equine Green Fellow, and Sir Ronnie and Cheryl know each other from being on committees and boards with one another. Now, Daquan, Cheryl, and Ronnie are going to talk about the field of impact investing, the progress we're making, and the challenges we should be addressing. Daquan, it's on you, man. I'm gonna let you take it from here. Hello everyone, my name is Daquan Oliver and I am excited to be here today with Cheryl Adorzi, the president of Equine Green and Sir Ronald Cohen, the chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment. Now, as we begin today, I just first wanna segue, um, Ronald, can you just share a little bit of your own thoughts of the book, um, Impact? Sure, Dick uh, I think all of us realize that uh, there are serious things wrong with our world, and we don't seem to be able to make any real progress in addressing them. Issues of uh, social inequality and environmental damage uh, have challenged us for decades. Uh, the proposition in, in my book, Impact, is that uh, we can't continue to try to throw more money at old ways that haven't worked uh, in dealing with these issues. We actually need to realize that they come from our economic system uh, with uh, businesses and investors making decisions on the basis of risk and return only, making profit and then leaving it to governments to clear up the mess they leave behind. And my proposition is that we can bring impact alongside profit to drive the decisions that investors and businesses make and get our economies to deliver solutions rather than to create and aggravate problems. And Serrano Cohen, you know, can you talk to me about in your own reimagining um, how might you describe the old model of capitalism and the new model that we're headed towards now? So in the old model, uh, the aim is to make money uh, as much as you can. And then if you're philanthropic, give it away at the end of your career or give some of it away at the end of your career. You create lots of problems while you make money. Governments have to tax everyone to deal with them. Uh, and uh, these uh, problems uh, plague our society. We don't seem to be able to deal with them. Uh, problems of uh, social equality, diversity, and so on. So in the new model, 
We know the impact every company creates. You can measure its employment impact, you can measure its product impact, and you can measure the impact from its operations on people and planet. And investors have already started to invest on the basis of return and impact. And as these investors get better information about that, then they invest in companies that do good and do well at the same time. The aim of a young person like you, uh, Daquan, becomes to build a business that improves lives and the planet at the same time as it makes money, instead of just making money. Just making money becomes a bad phrase. Without a doubt. And I know you refer to this in your book as the concept of risk, return, impact. Um, I know you've explained it um, a moment ago. I'm curious, Cheryl, um, you know, you're seeing it happen in real time across so many different leaders. Um, what have been the standout wins in the past and how are you seeing these things evolve within recent years? Well, before we uh, get into that, I just want to say what an absolute pleasure it is for me to be here with um, two wonderful friends. Um, you know, Ronnie, it's been uh, many years since we first met, but I don't think I've had the chance uh, to officially congratulate you on the book, Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. And honestly, Ronnie, I shouldn't call it a book. I'll, I'll call it a manifesto and such an articulation of your passion and commitment uh, to this issue of really trying to achieve a just and impact-led um, economy uh, needed now more than ever in this moment. So uh, thank you for the work that you do. And I should say thank you as well for mentioning and highlighting Echoing Green and other impact entrepreneurial networks like um, Ashoka and Endeavor and Equine Green in the book. It really uh, does mean quite a lot to all of us. Um, and you've been committed to this work for, for such a long time from your leadership at GSG for impact investment. I remember the last time I had the chance to spend some time with you uh, in New Delhi back in 2018 um, and the network that you're building around um impact, an impact economy, I think is very important. Uh, and Daquan, thank you for your leadership in guiding this conversation, having had the pleasure of meeting you first in 2014 and seeing you become uh, one of our country's most important social entrepreneurs and Echoing Green Fellow in 2015. Thank you for the work that you're doing with young people across this country uh, through we thrive. It's extraordinarily important and um, love uh, your call to action around unleashing the full genius of underestimated communities in many ways. Isn't that the goal that we're all seeking and building more inclusive and thriving economy? So just couldn't be more excited to be in this conversation with you all. And I'll just say, you know, look, um, Ronnie is the expert on all of this. He's really helped to build the field around impact investing. And I'll just say through the Echoing Green Network and Echoing Green um, community, we are in the stream of that conversation, sort of impact capitalism. But I think it's important to note that it's part of other um, what we call new economy ideas, right? So terms and efforts uh, from natural capitalism, sustainable capitalism, conscious capitalism, regenerative uh, economies, donut economics, circular economies. You know, I could go on and on. I think it's all part of this effort uh, in terms of what Ronnie uh, just shared earlier, um, that the current system is not working, right? The fact that the modern global economy may just be incapable of providing for the well-being of the majority of humanity. And if we do not sort of get at the systemic failure sort of the current system of taking, making, and wasting, this whole design infrastructure has just left in its wake this whole set of interconnected environmental and social crises that really threaten to undermine um, our well-being as um, planetary stewards uh, and people who are just trying to um, uh, get through life as best we can. So this is really existential work that we have to dig in on. So I do think the work that Ronnie is helping to lead around impact capitalism 
is really important, but are married to these other um, streams of work. You know, I was just on a call with some folks who were really thinking about sort of cooperative economics, sort of the solidarity, solidarity economy. And I think sort of many of the principles and practices that are percolating up everything from worker owned cooperatives, land trust, participatory budgeting, all the things that go into thinking about how do we build a more holistic um, and people planet centered um, economic infrastructure is the work that we all have to do. So um, really important um, that you've got leaders like Ronnie and so many others who are putting their shoulder to the wheel around figuring this out. And you know, so it, it's so curious to me, right? Listening to one, the various iterations of um, reimagining capitalism in the first place, right? Um, and I'm curious on specific differences that have emerged along the way, right? Now, one particular difference um, mentioned in your book, Ronnie, was really um, amongst a other amongst a ton of things. One of the things that really stuck out to me is the role of location. Um, you know, and you mentioned specifically, you know, in the past models like Silicon Valley and helping previous generations of tech entrepreneurs. Uh, can you share more just a little bit about um, how you see the previous generations, um, how those models differ from this new emerging role of environments for impact focused entrepreneurs specifically? Sure, sure. So Daquan, when I was uh, 26, um, I felt that uh, small was going to be beautiful, that venture capital was going to back companies. Uh, and, and it's what happened, basically. Uh, we saw venture capital take off and fund the tech uh, revolution. And if you look at where the tech revolution took place, it took place mainly in Silicon Valley and in one or two other places subsequently. So there were pockets in, in the UK, there were pockets in France, in Germany. Uh, in Israel, we probably have what comes closest to, to Silicon Valley. It wasn't really a revolution uh, that allowed everybody in the world to participate. And I think the impact revolution is different because the impact revolution uses entrepreneurship and technology, but it takes root wherever there are people like you, uh, Daquan, and like uh, Cheryl, who feel passionate about improving the lives of, uh, of others or improving our planet. And so the opportunity for impact unicorns uh, to arise all over the planet is much greater. And as you know from reading the book, I define an impact unicorn as a venture that doesn't just reach a value of a billion dollars, but also improves the lives of a billion people. So this impact revolution is going to be much more evenly distributed across the globe than the tech revolution was. And... Um... You know, it's, it's so relevant. I know, Cheryl, your team is working on a number of um, place-based um, innovations and seeding, whether it's from um, working with entrepreneurs who may not come from the typical backgrounds of Ivy League um, or so forth, um, or whether it is working with um, local innovators and pathways who see the entrepreneurs that maybe the old institutions might not. Um, I'm curious, how are you seeing that evolve just from a pathway standpoint um, and from Echo and Green's lens? No, I, I think that, um, you know, what we're learning through um, the field and movement of social innovation um, is sort of many paths to impact. And I do think sort of a wonderful development um, come through the terminology of the extraordinary Brian Stevenson, who's credited with the term proximity, right? Sort of valuing, giving currency and power um, to the impact of lived experience as sort of linking lived experience um, with the ability to be a solutionist in your own community. So I do think um, the notion of place and sort of expanding how you build generous networks and ecosystems around entrepreneurs, regardless of their pedigree, um, is sort of a wave of the future that certainly Echoing Green is investing in, um, you know, when we 
started, um, Echoing Green was founded, you know, now 35 years ago by the senior leadership of General Atlantic, came out of uh, the industry that Sarani uh, was a part of. Um, but many of uh, us who were early uh, recipients of Echoing Green support, as you mentioned, Daquan, came from um, fairly elite institutions, you as well, having gone to Babson, um, but recognizing over the years that talent is equally distributed, but opportunity is not. And that if we were going to solve our problems at scale, we were going to have to not only scale up, but scale out and scale deep. Um, and that has led us to sort of the expansion of perception and definition of where entrepreneurial talent comes from. And I really do like the work that so many of us are doing, moving beyond sort of the unit ana of analysis of the entrepreneur simply focusing on her or him, in your case, to sort of a, a broader ecosystem approach? What are all the inputs that are required to be that rising tide that lifts all boats, as uh, Ronnie talked about? So I think this is the work of the field and movement of social innovation in this movement. And again, sort of the leadership and work of leaders like uh, Ronnie and others is part and parcel of doing that. Now, what, what you both are describing is is feels like um like a coming of tides right um a, a, a lot of um demand coming from younger generations um ronnie you refer to this as the age of um impact entrepreneurship right um and you know there are a few things that i loved about that right new institutional things like benefit corporations um increased demand from younger generations and then you also have the rise of impact um, entrepreneurial organizations like Echoing Green. Um, now, what I'm curious on is, uh, while those things are so relevant to where we are today, with special regards to um, 2021, where we are today as a world, um, as we enter 2021, um, are there any particular levers that you feel are offering outsized opportunity for social entrepreneurs today? Right, just knowing that right now, listening, there are many social entrepreneurs, many social impact investors. Um, I'm curious what levers you feel might offer outsized opportunity as we enter 2021. So, I mean, my my motto uh, in my career was start young, think big, stick with it. Okay, uh, and that's a motto for entrepreneurs. Today, I would say pick a problem that you're passionate about solving. Create a business model that enables you to make money the more you deliver impact. Now, that can be in any field today. Coming out of uh, COVID-19, we're going to have a very difficult situation on our hands. We're going to have very high levels of unemployment. Many of the people who are unfortunately laid off aren't going to be able to go back to the types of companies they worked for. The reason is these big companies have slimmed down. And so the growth in employment is going to have to come from small and media sized and growth businesses. Now, if you as an entrepreneur can define a model today that helps to reskill the unemployed so that they are able uh, to get into, into new jobs or that can help uh, the less well-off in our society to manage their finances better through uh, uh, the help of a, of a tech uh, platform. Um, if you can create uh, a venture that uh, enables um, a young people who are in search of, of a, a profession uh, to receive enough money that they can follow their, you know, their hearts and, uh, and get funded by a career impact bond. And when they get into a job, eventually repay it at a very reasonable uh, rate as social finance, uh, you know, USA uh, is doing. And, and if you are expert in a technology uh, that can help uh, treat people through telemedicine or that can... Uh, uh, help uh, people to find jobs if they're in the gig economy uh, through an app. The opportunities are endless. 
And we're going to need entrepreneurship as we did with the tech revolution. Entrepreneurship by young people who have the vision and think outside of the box, then we really will create an impact revolution as big and as deep as that which tech brought about. And doing good and doing well is what it's all going to be about. Now, what I'm also curious on, right? I think there's just so many opportunities like that evolving that um, that we all see. Now, just as relevant are the barriers, um, whether it's of access, whether it's of scale. Um, and those things are just as evolving as um, the opportunities, right? Um, just speaking from the lens of social entrepreneur as well, navigating them. Um, I'm curious, how, um, Cheryl, might you be seeing the um, those barriers, those kind of obstacles being overcome right now? Um, and what do you see as the role of um, Equine Green and others who um, are responsible for helping um, this next generation's entrepreneurs navigate some of those challenges? Now, that's, a, that's an important question, Daquan. I'll, I will answer that, but I want to um, amplify and underscore a couple of the things that Ronnie just shared um, and, and that you uh, teed up for us and sort of saying, you know, what, what does this moment mean for all of us? Um, and, you know, it's interesting that I was... Um, uh, I studied the history of science in college and um, actually spent a lot of time uh, studying the bubonic plague and epidemics across uh, society. And sort of the preeminent uh, scholar, uh, Frank Snowden, a Yale historian, wrote sort of the seminal book on epidemics and societies, who reminds us that moments like this um, are moments for great transformation, as Ronnie alluded to, that we've got this moment in time where we're almost at a fork in the road around what is possible, right? Is this going to be the opportunity um, to um, move forward in a fundamentally new way or sort of a devolution where we give in to our, our lesser angels? And I think that's the question we're grappling with and need to figure out. I think from a democratic practice lens, um, I have long said that you can't look at the growth and rise of social innovation without looking at the rise of populism. I actually think they are the two sides of the same coin, right? So we all know that the current status quo is not working. The diagnosis is the same. However, the prescription for doing something about it is radically different. I look at phenomenal social entrepreneurs like you, Daquan, and your, your um, impulse is to fix it, right? Roll up your sleeves and get in there. Um, this populist wave that is spreading across the world has a nihilistic approach saying, consequences be damned, let's just blow it all up. There is no hope. And I think these, these forces are in tension in this moment, which is why we've got to really lean in and support social entrepreneurs like you and others who um, are appealing to our better angels, right? Who are trying to um, set us all up for success moving forward. I would say that's one thing. And then it's Sir Ronnie saying, you know, recognizing in this moment that we have got serious uh, transformational work to do on the other side of this. The Economist noted that 100 million of us are going to be plunged back into extreme poverty on the other side of this pandemic. We have got to got to think differently about expanding economic livelihoods, returning children to schools, and sort of the outsized opportunity to leapfrog barriers, which is what you all do as social entrepreneurs. You all have to be out in front of helping us rebuild society in really um, fundamental ways. Um, but the work for us to do um, as ecosystems players, the work that Ronnie is leading, that I and others are leading as impact entrepreneurial networks, um, is to help knock down some of those barriers. You certainly don't have access to enough capital um, for social impact enterprises. The handoffs are not seamless enough. Um, these networks are not interconnected enough. They're not um, appropriate legal um, and regulatory uh, networks and ecosystems to support your work and to determine what's allowed, what's not. Um, and I don't think there's a deep enough understanding amongst government on how you all as vital players and helping them execute on what they need to get done post-pandemic, those um, 
connections are not uh, forged yet either. So there are so many barriers that we all have to break down moving forward. But again, I think the work that Ron is leading, that um, Echoing Green and others are leading, we recognize that that is our work to do mediaries, and I think we're starting to do it. Yeah, Daquan, if I can uh, just uh, follow on what uh, Cheryl has, uh, has said, it seems to me some major barriers are coming down now. Uh, we don't necessarily uh, relate to it uh, if we're uh, you know, a young entrepreneur, but there's $30 trillion of money in the world today, a third of all professionally managed money that's going to achieve not just profit, but impact, right? It's the ESG money, environmental, social, and, and governance money, uh, 30 trillion of it, and nearly a trillion, it'll be a trillion this year, of impact investment, where you don't just have the intention to create the impact, you measure the impact that you create. You measure it so you can manage it and decrease it and raise money on the back of it. Now, the whole of the venture capital pool in the world is a trillion dollars, right? So something major is happening here. And I think the revolution is going to come in just uh, the next three to five years. What's the revolution? The revolution is we're going to be able to pick up the financial accounts of a company. And we're going to see their usual financial accounts with just the profit and loss in it, and we're going to see another set of accounts, which is a profit and loss and impact account. And it's going to reduce the profit of the companies that are polluting and using child labor and have insufficient diversity and don't pay uh, men and women equally. And it's going to increase the profits of those that are making a positive contribution. Now, we've never had this before. We've had philanthropic-minded business people who've made fortunes and have done it ethically and have tried to, to help along, uh, along the way poorer communities. And we see examples uh, of this um, today in, in, in every country, but it's a very small proportion of the total business world. The majority, the vast majority, 90% plus of business uh, is focused on just making money. Now, the barrier for that is being driven down first by the young generation that's on this webinar, which stop buying the products of companies they dislike because of their values. Okay? That started maybe 10 years ago. Investors became aware of this. And now you have 30 trillion going, and it's increasing, by the way, at 10 to 20 percent a year. Now, imagine the revolution that would be brought if you could look at the accounts of companies and know how much damage or good they were causing. The money would go to those that know how to deliver profit and impact at the same time. And, and then you'd have entrepreneurs like you and others on this uh, call and the thousands that uh, Cheryl has backed in, you know, in the last uh, decades, coming out and raising money from investors who want to achieve both profit and impact. And if you add to that 30 trillion, that uh, transparency on the impact created, the decisions made are going to be much more accurate about who to back and who not to, to back. And you really shift all of investment to achieving good as well as enabling people to do well. That's the revolution. And the great thing about it is whether you're a consumer or whether you're an entrepreneur or whether you're an employee in a big company or whether you're working for government or whether you're a philanthropist, you have a role to play in bringing this massive change about. And I totally um, agree with uh, Cheryl that this is a moment of great transformation. And I believe that the pressures on us requires to bring this transparency to business. Like there's no way government will have the money.
to deal with these huge social challenges, it's going to have to bring business and investors to provide solutions by its side. It's going to happen out of necessity, not out of choice. No, I mean, I love that. Um, in, in your book, you talk a lot about these kinds of um, new capital influxes and ways in which um, they are pushing forward um, this age of impact entrepreneurship. Um, I would love for you to just touch very briefly on those other elements. Um, for anyone else listening that may be curious, right? Um, for example, some of the things that really struck me were the ways in which 401ks and family offices are beginning to shift. Um, I'd love for you to just touch very briefly on how you're seeing some of those things shift and how someone might be able to either begin unlocking that or influencing that to flow in a more impactful way. So let's look at, um, at the 401 case. Uh, you know, many of you may not yet have 401 case, but your parents may, right? And if you ask them the question over the dinner table, mom or dad, do you know what uh, investments you're your 401k plan um, has got in it. They may well not know. Uh, whoever's managing it has been achieving profit in their view, except profit today, if you're a coal company, uh, isn't good. Investors have run away from coal companies because of the pollution. And in the book, I give examples of companies like ExxonMobil, which have doubled down on, on fossil fuels instead of going to clean energy, the, the value of ExxonMobil in, in three years has gone down from 500 billion to 140 billion, right? So if you don't believe in impact, you're gonna do badly as an entrepreneur or as an investor, okay? So I, I think transparency is our new human right. All of us should be pushing for transparency on the impacts that companies create. And we have to bring our governments to mandate it, like they did in 1933 on financial accounting, when people didn't really know what money companies were making. And four years after the crash of 29, we got gap accounting and auditing. So I'm saying within three to five years after the COVID-19 crash, we're going to get impact transparency. And that's what we all have to push for. No, that's amazing. I have um, so many more questions I want to ask you both with that. Um, you know, Cheryl, I was particularly interested in some of the work that Echo and Green has seen impact entrepreneurs from an SDG level as well. Um, I'll say those for just a moment. Um, Knowing that we're starting to near time, um, what I'm incredibly curious on is, um, to no surprise, especially in the social sector, um, historically when, you know, right now we're talking about reimagining systems, um, this one being the very important one of capitalism, um, those systems have not always been redesigned um, nor reimagined in a way that is inclusive of um, the very communities that they seek to empower. Um, now, in the social sector, particularly, we've seen this emerge in the form of um, severe underfunding for entrepreneurs closest to those communities um, as one particular example. Cheryl, I know Equity and Green's work um, is, has been focusing very closely on this issue, um, especially um, since COVID has begun. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how um, your team is investing in future generations in an equitable way? Sure. Uh, I thank you for raising that because this is um, this is sort of the conversation of our day, right? So here in the United States, in particular, we have just not been dealing with one crisis, that of a global pandemic, but uh, the twin crises of um, uh, COVID nineteen and structural racism that was really ignited um, after the death of 
and murder of Mr. Floyd in May of 2020. Um, and this is the journey and conversation this country has been on since that time. Um, and, you know, you can't sort of think about any of these issues without thinking about the disproportionate impact on communities of color. And might I just say, um, this is so very disheartening and, and tragic um, when you think about the percentage of deaths um, uh, of COVID-19 in this country, about 18% of the deaths have um, occurred amongst the African-American community, even though we represent about 12% of the population. Um, there was a staggering statistic when you think about the um, percentage um, compared with um, the percentage of deaths that happened amongst Africans who were transported to this country during the middle passage, that death rate was only about 10 to 15 percent versus 18 percent during the pandemic. I mean, you talk about the visible, the visible accounting of structural racism. It is just horrific. And it plays out across sectors. Um, what Ronnie was talking about in terms of financial flows are so very important, but we've also got to highlight and raise up these issues of um, uh, uh, inclusivity. You know, I was born and raised in Baltimore, and there's an investment um, leader, Eddie Brown, who runs the Brown Advisory Firm, who wrote a really important op-ed in the Washington Post a couple months ago saying, you know, in finance, firms owned by white men manage 98.7% of the 69 trillion managed by the U.S. asset management industry. Um, similarly, about 88% of senior fund managers are white and analysts and associate managers, the more junior positions are more than 70% white. So if we're gonna sort of move past um, this current moment to more a more inclusive uh, moment where you get uh, more inclusive perspectives, we've got to think about diversification and all of its manifestations, not just in the social impact sector where I sort of um, uh, apply my trade. So important, right? Um, and Equine Green has really been focused on um, sort of taking a, a strong look at the depth of racial inequity and philanthropic funding um, and the differences um, between the amount of capital available to social entrepreneurs like you, Daquan, social impact leaders like me. Um, it's quite stark to, despite our impact track records. Um, so I do think there is a conversation happening in this moment that rightly and finally has really centered these conversations around diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion. And, you know, again, we've got to continue to really center these conversations, Daquan, um, because we will never, ever get to the level of impact uh, that we need in this moment if we don't continue to focus like a laser on this. Okay, so I, I want to respond to that if we have time, because if we had the transparency I'm talking about, you can see through the Harvard Business School effort called the Impact Weighted Accounts, uh, that um, Apple uh, has a lack of diversity, which if you take the numbers of people who should be at every echelon relative to the demographics around their, their facilities, uh, reduces by $2.7 billion its positive employment impact, okay? Costco, which has twice the number of employees, 160,000 employees, has a billion dollars charge because of lack of diversity. Okay, so it's four times more effective than Apple in terms of diversity. Now, if we had these numbers, what would happen? What would happen is that the shareholder revolt that we just saw a couple of weeks ago at the Procter & Gamble shareholder meeting, where the shareholders, two thirds of them, voted against management because of deforestation due to the palm oil usage that uh, P&G uh, makes. Now, if you had this, this type of diversity information, investors would be rebelling against that too. And so I firmly believe that we can't just be talking about impact investment flowing to tackle social issues. We have to change our system so that our system corrects 
And it corrects because investors today realize that the businesses that are going to do best are those that deliver social impact and environmental impact. Now, wherever you are, you probably are aware of environmental impact getting a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, following wind today, finally, after you know, four decades. It doesn't make sense to just deal with environmental impact. You have to deal with the total impact of companies. The social impact is, you know, social inequality is no less important than environmental damage, right? And we really need to think in terms of the resilience of our societies. The resilience of our societies has to do with the social and the environmental. So if we want a fairer society and a more sustainable uh, world, We've got to push for impact in all its forms, but we're not going to achieve this if we don't get this transparency. So transparency is our right today, and we have to ask for it and push for it with our employers and with the government. I love it. Um, no, that was um, what... I mean, that's, that's the question of the day, right? Um, as, as you mentioned, Cheryl, um, as, as we look ahead towards, you know, um, I know there's a few um, potential conversations stemming out of this. Um, you both are seeing these um, social innovations playing out at a global scale. Um, Ronald, you discussed quite a few examples with Zipline, Tala, and Della. Um, yeah. I'm curious, as we... Um, begin to turn it over to the audience. What key lessons are you both seeing that fellows, social entrepreneurs, as well as um, the entrepreneurial networks and leaders who are supporting them, um, who are listening and should be taking away? Do you want to kick off for show or do you want me no, to- No, after that? you, Ronnie, please. <laughs> so I, I think if you want the best chance of success today, if you want to attract capital in the best, in the easiest way, if you want to attract customers in the easiest way, and if you want to attract talent in the easiest way, then set up an impact venture. That's what's gonna give you the biggest chance of success. Up until now, it may have been Difficult, it has been difficult to raise capital for impact entrepreneurs, but that is changing now. You see, the leaders of the private equity industry, uh, the biggest firms, KKR, uh, Bain Capital, uh, others in Europe uh, like uh, Partners Group, all raising impact funds. And it hasn't quite come to impact venture capital in the way that it should in Silicon Valley, but it's going to come there. Uh, funds like Double Bottom Line that invested in, you know, in Tesla and, and others are going to be the future. So the, the trend is your friend. This is where things are going. If you manage to go in the same direction, you will be helped by the trend. Per perfectly said. I don't think... Um... I could say it uh, any better. And, you know, I think I would just sort of appeal um, to young people who are participating in this session um, to your role and responsibility as the leaders of tomorrow. Um, you know, I feel like, you know, too much, uh, to who much is given, much is expected. Um, and there are so many existential threats um, to our well-being as a planet um, that we need you all to take your smarts, your commitment, um, and put your shoulder to the wheel around tackling um, these challenges. I think it is really sort of the work of your generation. Um, and it's, it's in many ways the interesting thing about social innovation is it's sort of this wonderful marriage of where purpose meets impact and sort of the synergies that are ignited out of that intersection um, is good for you personally but it's good for the planet and for others um, and you know we simply 
we just cannot look away in this moment. You know, I was just sort of rereading um, sort of the distance traveled during this um, really tough moment for so many people. And again, obviously, I'm here in the U.S. context, although this is a global conversation. But, you know, another 8 to 10 million Americans have slipped into poverty since May of this year. There are like now 20 million more Americans hungry today since before the pandemic, which should really um, cut so deeply, especially as we enter this um, holiday season. And we're now moving past, you know, 6 million households who have missed a rent or a mortgage payment um, since September. Um, so, you know, th this this is so dramatic and existential um, and inhumane. You know, again, I just sort of you talked about human rights, Ronnie, transparency as a human right, but the right um, to access to food and to shelter. Um, we are better than this as a society. And again, I feel like it's your civic responsibility as extraordinarily smart, committed young people to get into this fight and use the tools, principles, and practices of um, what uh, Ronnie has been talking about, impact entrepreneurship, about the work Echoing Green has helped to facilitate around social innovation. This is the work of the world in this moment, and you've got to commit yourselves um, to engaging this. There's just no fight that's worth fighting uh, more than this one. Thank you so much, Cheryl, Ronnie. Um, and for the wider audience, we just want to leave you with this to think about. Are there elements discussed today to reimagine capitalism that you can use to reimagine the systems that you yourself are working to fix? As a longtime entrepreneur and founder of Brown and Healthy, that session was very enlightening. And not only for me, it's also a path forward for both investors, entrepreneurs, and other critical stakeholders in this space. So thank you for that session, you three. It was really, really amazing. Now. As a reminder, you can purchase Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change on Amazon. And now we're gonna ask that you go join the Hubbelo Tabletops to discuss the prompt posed by Ronnie, Cheryl, and Daquan. You ready for the prompt? Okay, here it is. Are there elements discussed to reimagine capitalism that you can use to reimagine the systems you're working to fix? Again, Head on over to the Hubbelo Tabletops to discuss this prompt. Are there elements discussed to reimagine capitalism that you can use to reimagine the systems you are currently working to fix? So go on over and join the Hubbelo Tabletops. <laughs>